Hello, I'm Jay Strack coming to you from Orlando, Florida to say how excited I am to once again be given the opportunity to preach a revival service at Pleasant Grove Baptist Church, one of the most exciting churches in all of Georgia. I mean, Cracker Barrel knows where Pleasant Grove is. I mean, you are the talk of the state. It's a joy to be back with Chris, Pastor Chris with air quotes, always an honor. But I hope you'll enjoy this revival message. I pray God will move on the hearts of many families, and I cannot wait to see you again in person. Thank God for your faithful ministry. So if you have your Bibles today, I want to share with you how to get through the worst day of your life. Now, if you've ever, somebody's written a book on how to get through the storms of life or the worst day of life, if somebody's written a blog on it or somebody's preaching a sermon, you have a right to ask, have you ever been through a day like that? Let me be honest with you. I've been through many worst days of my life. Very few of us have only had one worst day of our life because worst days take on different meanings, does it not? As we go through the various seasons of life. Sometimes we're going through a worst day because of what we're going through. Sometimes we're going through the worst day because of somebody we love and care about is going through. Sometimes we're going through a worst day when maybe what our nation is going through. So I want to talk to you very practical from the Word of God, that God gives us a sure word when you feel like, I have no idea how I'm going to make it. I want to share with you what I believe are three biblical principles. Now, I know some of you always kind of snicker when the preacher says there's three truths, right? Because preachers always have three truths. Now, really, I have 17 truths. Do you want to hear three or 17? That's what I thought, so back off. All right, so, uh, oh yeah, man, tell us those three, preacher. That's, pre that's what we love, three. All right, it could be worse, right? Exodus chapter 14. Now, this is a long but familiar story. The children of Israel have been in bondage for decades and decades. They had gotten away from God, they had wandered off, they drifted into Egypt, and now they're enslaved. And that's the way it usually is. Nobody ever plans on getting in some of the situations we find ourselves. But if we're not careful, circumstances are the crowd, are our own choices, kind of lead us into what they would say our friends from the mother country, a sticky wicket. You'll find yourself in guacamole. You'll find yourself in trouble, a tight spot. So ladies and gentlemen, the children of Israel were enslaved. They had felt the sting of the taskmaster's whip. They were in trouble. 
and their firstborn had been killed. You know the story of how Moses even ended up in the, the Nile and that story of the bulrushes and being and, and the most crocodile-infested body of water in the known world at that time. Things were so bad on land that Moses' mother said he stands a better chance with the crocodiles. Now that's when you know things are bad, when a mother has to make that kind of choice. So the children of Israel had prayed and prayed and prayed. They had almost been crushed under the weight of all the persecution and the enslavement. And finally, God raised up a man named Moses. And Moses boldly went before Pharaoh and said, let my people go. And so away the story is. Finally, after the great contest, the great tug of war, you remember, the darkness that covered the land. You remember the plagues that came? Every plague was God pushing a man-made Egyptian deity off its pedestal till it landed in pieces on the ground. When the Nile turned to blood, that's because the Egyptians worshiped Hopi, the goddess of the Nile. When darkness covered the land, that's because the Egyptians worshiped Ra, the sun god. When the locusts destroyed the crops, that's because they had just prayed to the God of fertility and offered big sacrifices, asking, the, asking that goddess to bless the crops so the locusts devoured it. Frogs came because they had an Egyptian with a frog head. The Egyptians had a deity with a frog head. In other words, every one of the plagues was God showing, I am the Lord God and besides me there's none others. Finally, Pharaoh relented and said, get away, go, get out of here. So we're gonna pick up the story. The children of Israel are on their way. And let's begin in verse 10 of chapter 14. When Pharaoh drew near, the children of Israel lifted their eyes and behold, the Egyptians marched after them and they were very afraid. The children of Israel cried out to the Lord, and then they said to Moses, is it because there were no graves in Egypt that you've taken us away to die in the wilderness? Why have you dealt this way with us to bring us up out of Egypt? Is this not the word that we told you in Egypt, saying, leave us alone? Let us alone. We want to serve the Egyptians, for it'd be better for us to serve the Egyptians than we should die in the wilderness. Then Moses said to the people, do not be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you've seen today, you will see them again no more forever. The Lord will fight for you and you shall hold your peace. Now, ladies and gentlemen, that sounds like a wonderful, wonderful statement of faith, does it not? Stand still, watch what God will do. He'll fight for you. He'll destroy the Egyptians. There's only one problem with that verse. It's the next verse. The Lord says to Moses, why are you crying out to me? Tell the children of Israel that they go forward. That they go forward. So ladies and gentlemen, Let's just make a note. When you're going through the worst day of your life, and we're gonna paint this picture, and you agree with me, this is one of the worst days in the life of Israel. When you're going through the worst day of your life, you only have three options. All three of them are listed. Number one, you can go back. Go back. Go back to an old life, go back to old habits, go back to an old situation, go backwards. Things are tough, things aren't working, things are not the way we thought they were gonna be. I'm gonna leave, I'm gonna take my ball, I'm gonna go home. I'm gonna get a do-over, I'm gonna get a backseas, I'm gonna get a mulligan. There are those that say, I can go backwards. Moses said, no, you can't go backwards. Pharaoh is so angry, Pharaoh's out of control. We've already seen what he'll do. The, the weight of his wrath, we can't go backwards. Let's stand still 
and see what God will do. So option number two, curtain number two, stand still. We can't go backwards. You know, my, my life, when I gave my life to the Lord at 17, I couldn't go back to drugs. I knew that. I couldn't go back to my rebellion. I couldn't go back to drinking a lot. I couldn't go back to trying to drown my sorrows. I couldn't go back to that old lifestyle. I knew I couldn't go back, but so why don't I just stand still? Let me ask you a question, businessmen, business ladies. Let me ask you a question as parents. Let me ask you a question in your marriage or in your walk with God. If you find yourself standing still today, in reality, that's the same as going backwards. Would you agree? Some of us have been standing still spiritually. We're in a rut. Can I give you my favorite definition of a rut? It comes from a guy named Zig Ziglar that I was privileged to know very well. He mentored me. I knew him for over 25 years. Zig Ziglar, the great motivator, had a great definition of a rut. You ready? Write it down, because see, you'll forget the vast majority of what you hear. Hello. Within 24 hours, if you don't write it down. Zig Ziglar says a rut is a grave with both ends knocked out. So get out of that rut. You find, I'm in a rut. I, I'm in, I'm, you know, I'm just kind of, you know, I'm in a rut, man. Things just aren't working out. I just don't feel like I used to feel. I'm not, you know, and, so get out of the rut. It's a grave with both ends knocked out. So option one, you can go backwards. Option two, stand still. Or you can do option three, which the Lord said, tell the children of Israel to go forward. To go forward. Now let's pick up the story. Number one, what do you do when you feel like quitting? What do you do when you feel like quitting? Well, I've got about seven steps for you here, and I want you just, we're going to look at it briefly. But this is to just give you a word if you're in one of those situations, spiritually or financially, or you're battling a health issue, you're battling a relationship issue, you feel like you're stuck, you feel like you're in a dead end. And by the way, I also know what it's like to feel like you're in a deep, deep hole that you've dug with your own two hands. And you see, one thing that doesn't help is when people remind you it's your fault you're in the hole you're in. Isn't that helpful? You know, I can just see somebody saying to the Hebrews, well, you know, you're the blame. You're the reason you're in Egypt. You made bad choices. You let circumstances. You overreacted. You made that mistake. You did this. You said that. You know, some people get hysterical. You ever needed a friend or a comforter and they're going crazy on you? Other people get historical. They remind you of all the bad choices you've ever made. Thank you very much. Thank you for that. Word to your mother. I mean, you know what I mean? Come on. What's that about, right? So listen to me very carefully. What do you do when you feel like quitting and going back? Number one, don't. Thank you. I'm here all week. Listen, don't. The greatest piece of advice a friend can give a friend when you feel like quitting, when you feel like giving up, when you've been swimming and swimming and you go, I can't go on anymore, don't stop swimming. I remember one time as a teenager, my buddies, we'd been partying and some fool said, you said, well, you're not supposed to call somebody a fool. You didn't know Eugene. <laughs> but anyway, you, his own mama said, no, but anyway. Eugene said, let's swim across the river. Okay. You know, you know, by the way, you know what the famous last words of a redneck is, right? Watch this. Watch this. <laughs> Thank you. See you, Bubba. All right, anyway, so here we go. So we start swimming across this river. It was a mile across. I can't tell you, I didn't think I was going to make it. And the guy that was a little bit right behind me, all right, said, man, we can't go back. It's a lot further back. We got to keep going forward. We'd already gone past the point of no return. When you feel like quitting, don't. You know, the Bible is full. I'm always asked, Jay, would you describe the Bible as a book of love? Well, yes. 
The love of God, that's certainly the central message. Well, what about, would you describe the Bible as a book of peace? Yes, there is wisdom on how to have peace in the midst of a storm. But can I be honest with you? What I love about the Bible is it teaches me how to keep going. Endure. Do you know there's a word used throughout the Greek New Testament, and it's either translated patience or endurance. The same word, hupomone. Endure. And it doesn't mean you fold your hands and I'm just going to, I guess there's nothing I can do about it and I, I guess I've just got to take it. No, it's a triumphant fortitude. It's lift up your head, sing a song, and keep going. The key word in the New Testament is endurance. Endure. Run the race with endurance. Have patience. That's the same Greek word. Endurance. Persevere. Keep on keeping on. So I love the fact that I know that I'm loved. I know I've got the peace of God, and God has given me a real-world tenacity for my family's sake, for my friend's sake, for my own sake, for heaven's sake, for my country's sake. I can't quit. Keep on keeping on, all right? Number one, when you feel like quitting, don't. Number two, examine your progress. Do you know when you look at where the children of Israel were encamping, where they were in proportion of the, to the Red Sea, and where they were on once would happen, they would get across the Red Sea. They were almost as close to the beginning of the Promised Land as they were to go back to where they were. Can you imagine if they would have turned around and had to go into the teeth of this angry, and by the way, the Egyptians that were marching after them was the largest known army in the world, the most powerful known military force in the world. So number one, don't. Number two, take a moment when you feel like quitting and examine your progress. Why quit when you might be a lot closer to the finish line than you are to going back? Number three, plan new goals. You say, Jay, when you're in a difficult situation, when you don't think the sun's gonna really come out tomorrow, when you don't know how you're gonna pay those bills, you don't know how you're gonna turn that relationship around, you don't know how you're gonna have the courage to keep going through certain treatments. Jay, this is not the time to plan new goals. Do you know what counselors teach us? You know what biblical counselors teach us? One of the most healing things we can ever do in any moment of great discouragement is to just simply give yourself a few minutes to go, if I could do anything, what would I do? Because it reminds you, you have a lot to fight for. It's like the teenager who's going through a tough time. She thinks the world would be better off without me. Somebody's bullied you online. Somebody that doesn't have the courage to talk to you in person somebody that doesn't have the courage to do anything with their own life, and somebody will try to bully you and try to, you know, all these things that go on, especially when you're a young person. And how many times have adults said, I wish I could help every teenager know when they're going through those tough times in a teenage year, they have no clue what's waiting for. What you're going through is not that big a deal. I know it feels like it, but you have perspective. So you've got to give yourself perspective. Plan some new goals. Number four, be grateful. Now, I find this fascinating. When you feel like going back, take a moment. The Puritans, those who gave us Thanksgiving, Puritans, when they got off that Mayflower and they went through that first year, they'd already been on land a year before they had the first Thanksgiving. Very difficult year. You know what they did? The Puritans had a saying. I'm going to ask you to write it down. I promise you'll love this. The Puritan said, before you ask God for anything new, you have to pay rent. Pay rent. Thank him for what he's already done. Let me give you an example. I appreciate the kind words uh, Pastor Reese said about student leadership. We're so thrilled that some of your students were at 101 last week, and this week we have a 201 going on in D.C., and then next week we have a group of your students going with us to London, Oxford, Normandy, and Paris. So we're very grateful for that. New, as I said last week, New Hope helped me launch student leadership. So I'm very, very grateful uh, that you would trust us with some of your students. 
But when we go to Rome, you know one of the highlights for me? Yes, they want to see the Colosseum. Yes, they want to see the Forum. Yes, they want to see the Pantheon. They want to see the Trevi Fountain. But you know one of my favorite places to take them are the catacombs, where the early Christians went underground. You see, in Rome, the volcanic ash was soft enough you could chisel out, so they buried people underground in those volcanic stone because you could chisel it out. It was soft. It was pliable. Do you know the early Christians met in the tombs so they could worship without being put to death or in prison? With torch lips, they would make their way through those catacombs. Do you know what we found on the walls of those ancient catacombs from 2,000 years ago? Like, for example, when Paul wrote to the church at Rome and talked to them about those great doctrinal truths, they were meeting in the catacombs. Guess what? Picture of Daniel carved coming out of the lion's den. Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego coming out of the fiery furnace. Noah's ark. Lazarus being raised, Jesus dying on the cross and the tomb being empty. Do you realize what motivated those early Christians when they were going through the worst time of their life? Was a reminder of God delivering his children, God keeping his promise, God saying, don't give up. So all through the Christian life and all through the word of God, we're constantly being told, rehearse your victories. Can I be honest with you? My wife and I have been married over 40 years. We went through a time when our daughter, we almost lost Missy four or five times in the pregnancy. She had to have open heart surgery when she was two months old. I remember telling the heart surgeon, please doc, fix her heart, because when she asked Jesus to come in, I don't want him falling out of the heart. You know, I mean, you know, I was young, but anyway. And, uh, and, and I want you to know we owed $150,000, no insurance, I'm the hippie kid who got saved off the streets, barely got into college, got through, went to seminary, no insurance, and we owed $150,000. So I know when things are hopeless and God somehow is there, when you're afraid that your baby won't make it, God was with us. And then when she did make it, and now I had no way that $150,000, that was more money than the U.S. government had, I thought. Little did I know it would be true today, but the, anyway, sorry. But, but anyway, but I, I want you to know, I mean, how in the world, well, there's no way. Yet we were tithing, we were giving, we were trusting. God got us through that. We were able to pay those bills. We were able to keep our word. And folks, you know, saw that we were trying and honored. And worked. I just want you to know, when you've lived, you go through those type times in a marriage or a tough time when you've been hurt or your best friends let you down or that job situation that everybody promised uh, didn't pan out. I mean, every one of us have been through it. So now as we go through this stage of life, guess what? We can look back and see time after time, God was faithful. God can keep going. So have those catacomb moments in your life. Turn weakness into strength. I went from being a junkie to the guy that wrote 10 books on the drug scene. I went from being the kid that was a, an addict and druggy and dropout to speaking in 10,000 public schools. I began to try to take my weaknesses, take all the lemons that the devil gave me, the broken homes, the physical abuse, the sexual abuse, and, and kind of be the guy that kind of rubbed that lemonade in his eyes. And try to say to a generation of young people, you don't have to live like this. You don't have to go through this. You don't have to be a victim. You can be a victor. So we can turn our weaknesses into strengths. Redirect your thinking. Listen, every one of us have made mistakes. None of us have batted a thousand. The Braves are home of some of the greatest baseball players and greatest pitchers that we know in baseball in the modern era. From Hank Aaron to Chipper Jones, none of them batted a thousand. John Smoltz and Maddox and those guys, they didn't win every game. Nobody bats a thousand. So you've got to learn to redirect your thinking. 
Never let yesterday's mistakes or yesterday's slights or yesterday's hurt take up too much of your today. Can I give you a great quote? Don't crucify your today between the thief of yesterday and the thief of tomorrow. The thief of yesterday. I went through a lot of stuff yesterday. I'm not gonna let that ruin my today. And I have no promise of tomorrow. All I got's what? Today. And you know what I've learned after these years? If you do today right, that's enough. If I get today right, I'm ready for tomorrow. If I get it tomorrow, bring it on. Most of all, I know somebody's got my back. When the Lord has your back, you got somebody's got your back. Number seven, seek godly counsel. In a few minutes, I'm going to ask, do you need to give your life to the Lord? Would you let an encourager talk to you for just a couple of moments? Do you need a church home? Would you let somebody give you some godly counsel? Are you going through something in your job or your health or your marriage or your family? You don't know which way to turn? Would you let someone pray with you and encourage you? That's one of the great steps you take when you feel like quitting. So ladies and gentlemen, here it is. We can go backwards. And can I be honest with you? When the children of Israel were, got in a tight spot, man, they hit below the belt. They hit below the belt. Moses, did we not tell you to leave us alone? Is that what they said? Moses, do you not remember? We kept telling you we want to stay in Egypt. Can I share with you a little Hebrew? Would you like to be able to use a Hebrew phrase on your friends? Kind of lay that on a teacher one day. Lay that on, you know, somebody, you know, your Sunday school, you know, somebody. Lay a little Hebrew on them. Can I teach you a Hebrew phrase? If you've got a pen, pencil, lipstick, mascara, write down this phrase in the margin of your Bible. I promise you I'll say it slow and phonetically so you can, you'll use this, I promise. Here's a little Hebrew. You never know when you need a little Hebrew. You ready? Liar, liar. <laughs> Pants on fire. <laughs> They're lying. They never said we want to stay in Egypt. And then they made this statement. Is it because they ran out of room to bury people in Egypt? What is the one country in the history of the world synonymous with tombs, graves, embalming, mummies, burial? It's Egypt. Man, you know, some people, when they get in a tight spot, they start lashing out. But you can't let people saying ridiculous things affect you. They told a lie. They never said, we want to stay in Egypt. Number two, Moses, stand still. And by the way, do you know how they began their journey? Let me just show you quickly. Look at the last two verses of chapter 13 real quick. Last two verses. I know Reese told me he always preaches 25 minutes, so I'm trying to stay true to that. <laughs> That's what I thought. All right, but anyway, notice these last two verses of chapter 13. You'll find this, I think, I found this very interesting. It says, the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light, so as to go by day and night. He did not take away the pillar of cloud by day, nor the pillar of night from before the people. Now notice, if you would, in chapter 14, beginning in verse 8. It talks about the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. He was pursuing, chasing the children of Israel. And the children of Israel went out with what? What's it say? Say it. Boldness. What else? What's another version you have? Confidence. You know what I love about the King James Version? It says they went out with a high hand. Now, what does that mean? They're giving the Lord a high five? Or maybe they're Baptists, they only raise one hand, John, you know what I mean, right? But guess what? Here's what I want you to understand. The children of Israel began their journey with boldness, enthusiasm, and confidence. Do you know why? They'd seen God push down all the Egyptian deities, and they'd seen that God himself was leading them with a pillar of fire and a pillar of cloud. Now, ladies and gentlemen, almost all of us begin our journey with great enthusiasm and confidence. 
But along the way, and please make a note of this, just note to self, you got to make a choice. Because along the way, it's easy to get your eyes off the Lord and put your eyes on other people. If you're going on a long journey, bless you, you're going on a difficult time, you're trying to climb out of this hole you've dug for yourself, there's gonna be some discouraging moments. And along the way, there's gonna be a bunch of friends complaining or belly aching or saying, hey, let's go back. You need to go back. The devil, let's go back. Now, when they turned away, you know what they saw behind them? They shifted their gaze. They saw that Pharaoh pursued them, mightiest army in the world. You know, with all those chariots and horses, guess what? A cloud of dust would come up, blacken out the sun. The mightiest army in the known world was hotly pursuing them. You talk about a cloud of dust. So here's the note to self. I promise you, you'll use this. Every day, I'm gonna have to make a choice. Am I going to intentionally keep my eyes on the pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire? By the way, up here in the balcony, aren't you grateful that I'm using you about being near where God wants you to be, right? And the folks over here, Sorry, sorry, but anyway, but anyway so, so some of you are saying, I'm glad I sat over here, right? But anyway, the pillar of fire, the pillar of cloud, keep your eyes on him. But you have to make a choice because every day, every time I turn on the news, I see a pillar of dust. Every time the Supreme Court gavel goes down, it seems like there's a pillar of dust. And certain people that you hang around, there's dust. So you'd have to make a choice. You want the dust of the world or do you want the presence of God in your life? It's a choice. Now, ladies and gentlemen, they began their journey with enthusiasm and confidence. Number two, when things got tough, some of them wanted to go back. Moses said, no, stand still. And the Lord interrupted Moses, said, Moses, you're my man, I'm proud of you, but quit crying out to me. Tell the children of Israel I only got one direction. I want them to go forward. And by the way, there's only one time in that journey when the pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire was not in front of them. And do you know where it was? It was behind them to protect them because the closer the Egyptians got, the pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire came back here. You want to know where that phrase, I've got your back, comes from? Note to self, if God has my back, my back has been had. You understand? When the Lord has my back, my back's covered. What you need to know and understand, God's got one direction, New Hope. One direction, young couple. One direction, ma'am. And I know some of us are going through that moment, and I could spend 20 minutes trying to describe every moment. You know what those moments are like. If you're going through it, you don't need me to try to describe it. You know. But with all my heart, as I prayed, I said, Lord, give me a word that would just remind us we're not going through this by ourselves. We're not alone, and the Lord's got one direction for us. Let's go forward. I've been doing this a long time. Can I just say, when it comes to trust in the Lord, come on in. The water's great. How do I know what to do when you're losing heart? Been there. How do I know what to do when you feel like going back? Been there. How do I know what to do when you feel like, man, what is going on? With all my heart, for all those that encouraged me, all those that helped me, and the help of the Lord himself and his precious spirit, I'll be forever grateful. I said, Lord, I not only want to be out of the pit, I don't ever want to get back in the pit. And with all my heart, I don't want anybody else to get in the pit. So if I could do something to keep anybody from getting in the pit, I'm a happy camper. So today the decision is yours. You know what, it's, what that means. Some of us have stopped. We're standing still spiritually. Some of us are out of church. Some of us are out of the Lord's will. Some of us have not followed the Lord and believers' baptism. Some of us are not giving. Some of us are not leading or serving. Some of us are just coming and enjoying what's going on. Some of us need to get back involved. Some of us need to become the leader God's called us to be. Some of us need to be at this altar. Some of us need to be talking to an encourager. Some of us need to ask Jesus to come into our heart. But wherever you are, my prayer is today, 
will be the day you'll go forward in faith.